Ooh, somebody's getting spicy. Guess Matt's not the spiciest one in the house. Welcome back to Comic Book Nation Season 6, the only show that does it all for geek culture and the official podcast of comicbook.com. I am your host, Kofi Outlaw, and as you can see, we are doing something very different for right now. We are getting a whole remodel of the comic book offices here in lovely Nashville, Tennessee. And so we're going to be at home for a minute. We're all at home. It's like the COVID era again. <laughs> oh, man, I'm having flashbacks. But we're bigger and better than ever. At comic book nation so uh let's just go man let's just go and then r.i.p to our old studio i'm gonna miss you you brought us out of the pandemic we had some great memories i don't think we're legally covered to uh sing the boys to men song because i don't think we could pay for it but uh you you know the tune we'll just hum a little mm -hmm. I think that's all we can afford. So let's keep going. Uh, but today we have a whole show. We do it all for geek culture. We're never joking about that. And today we've got so much to cover. There's big things in geek movie news. Our main topic today will be kind of the peak geek TV. We are experiencing some euphoria right now with a bunch of TV shows hitting and delivering. So we're going to get into all of that. Yeah. Plus news could get spicy again, just like it did the last couple of weeks because after our infamous crow debate about the first pictures of the crow, <laughs> now we got a whole ass trailer to talk about. So we got to get into that. And I'm so excited. So things are happening on the horror front with Scream and the whole Scream franchise that we got to get into. As I said, we're going to be talking about Halo. Invincible Season 2 Part 2 is here. Shogun is still here. And uh, we got to hear from our own, very own John Blackthorne, a.k.a. Connor Casey, who is back with us from the uh, shores of Italy. We haven't heard from him about Shogun, and, you know, we always got to get the Blackthorn view on things. Plus, Marvel has done a whole X-Men relaunch, and we have got to get into that because there's some interesting things to talk about there. So a little bit of comics talk as well. If you guys are just getting into our show, it's been a busy week. There are a lot more voices or a lot more people listening out here. We've had a jump in some listeners uh, mainly mm. due to our last few podcasts and, you know, our new whole comic book nation, which is full of spinoff shows. So if you are just getting into us, make sure you subscribe to our podcast feeds. We're on all the major ones, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, uh, because we have a lot that we're doing. We do all things for geek culture. So we have Anime Initiative that kicks off the week every week with our expert comic book anime team talking to all things anime. We also have Matt every Wednesday doing the poll list where all the new major publisher in indie comics get, we just filter them through Matt's head and he picks out the best ones for you guys to know about and we get into it. We also sometimes have to get into it if things aren't hitting like they should be. Me and Matt are also doing recaps of Halo Season 2, which we realize some of you may not have access to the wonderful mountain of entertainment that is Paramount+. Plus. But we are out here just kind of sharing with you guys whether or not this show is really coming up big in the second season. And spoilers, we'll be getting into it here today. Also, we have Invincible Season 2 recaps happening I'm joined by a variety of hosts, from Logan Moore to our own assistant managing editor, J.K. Schmidt, to tell you guys what is happening in Invincible and to just kind of murk out about some of the crazier things that are going on in that show. Yeah, it's a lot we got going on. If you're an MCU head, you can go over to the fade of uh, the feed of Phase Zero, say that three times fast, and check out all things MCU and Pokemon fans. We still have our Pokemon, a wild Pokemon has appeared podcast. So check out all of that as well. All right, those are the uh, every, those are all the ads we got to do. So uh, let's get into the show this week. Janelle, yeah. let's talk. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. The Crow, you had very strong. This became, it was just you, me, and Matt here. I mean, Connor wasn't even here. And things still exploded in uh, getting getting uh, real spicy. 
And shout out to Brywood in the comics asking if we hired Bob Chapek with all these episodes we're doing. Yeah, we flood in the zone. Yo, the man had to go somewhere. I mean, Disney didn't want him, so he had to go somewhere. So we were like, hey, we got a $5.99 bargain bin. You know, we can take that and we'll make some stuff. But uh, let's get back to subject. So, Janelle, now yeah. you were very, I mean, you were fired up about the Crow pictures. And the those mullet. were just pictures. Yeah. The mullet. The nipple tattoos, all of it. You were just, you were not in for Gen Z's crow. And, you know, your millennial slash Gen X liner sensibilities were offended by what you saw. How did you feel about a whole ass trailer? Um, yeah. Okay. So the mullet aside, which you can't really tell that he has a mullet. Like, it's not as pronounced as you think. Um, I, I think this looks amazing i i am really wow. yeah i am really really excited about this i mean the violence the blood the concept of like him coming back in the way that he does like it it god the mullet is so bad but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just like the shaved on the sides and the, i just oh god i just really wish they i just wish they would have given me long hair but Aside from that, like the nipple tattoos don't bother me. Um, I, I think his body looks insane. Uh, I had no idea he was hiding. Isn't this Pennywise? Yeah. Like Pennywise is jacked. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> I'm very intrigued about the storyline. Obviously, I think it mirrors the original uh, uh, like a lot, which is kind of what I wanted. I expect that. Um, it's been long enough where I don't need like a continuation. I just kind of need something that is very close to the original. So I'm hoping that we get that. Um, we have the trench coat. So I'm down with that. I'm very happy about it. And I'm just going to kind of, I'm just going to look the other way when it comes to the, uh, the mullet. It's, I'm still complaining. I don't like it, but it, this this looks listen, awesome. Listen, I, I'm not going to get into this because, <laughs> you know, we had a very spirited debate about this when we were looking at the pictures and about we got into Nashville. It got really close, literally close to home. But we know, I mean, the, the kind of haircut and the dangly earrings, like we know around these parts, that is a that's a look. It's that's very a vibe. familiar for us. Yeah, yes, it's it's a vibe like we know. And I'm not saying any more than that. I'm just saying that around here, it is a vibe. Yeah. So I, I wasn't, I don't like it in real life either, but like, <laughs> I guess that's where we are. Yep. Um, here's what I'll say. I, I'll say, cause this still got a lot of hate online. Like this did not win over a lot. Of I people. know. Um, Which is but, such a bummer to me. Yeah, it is. I, I had mixed opinions because I feel like what they've done here is at least take they're not imitating the gothic aspect and, and atmosphere of the first crow movie. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't feel in any way that that's being replicated here. It's not style over substance, which that movie very much was. Mm -hmm. It's this is playing more with like, and people, I don't know why this is a criticism, but it is, but uh, people like are saying like, it's John wick, but with this kind of undead mechanic to it that you've added and that's what I thought was the most interesting thing about this trailer. Like yeah. the scenes where how he's taking out people by willing to take himself out. Like we've seen Wolverine and people do that kind of stuff. But this trailer makes it gross and gruesome yeah. and makes it look yeah. like by the time this guy <laughs> is done, like this is going to be some there will be bloodish where he's just at the end. He just looks at the camera. He's like, I'm done. And he just like drops dead. That'd be <laughs> hilarious. And I would love it. But um, yeah he's going to be like slathered in blood and this is not going to be an easy road of revenge for, for him or anybody else. And that's the kind of thing that it appealed to that James Wan death node or whatever that, uh, what was that Kevin Bacon movie he did? I always forget it. Cause there's too many death movies. Um, you know what I'm talking about though? Ugh. Come on Kevin listeners, Bacon. help me out. God, you guys, you guys leave me hanging so much here. I need, like, <laughs> I need to like, we need to draft in like one, one of those weird encyclopedia head people who knows all the death stuff. Sentence? Death sentence. Death sentence. Yeah. Yay! But, I did it. Thank yeah, you, right Janelle. Off the tongue, that one, Yay. Kofi. Yeah. No, there's so many. Okay, it, it, well, his previous film he was involved in right before that was Dead Silence. So like, you know you what I'm saying? You can't complain like, about people not knowing when you don't know. 
But bro, there's like, <laughs> like I know a lot. I just, it's not that's not that I didn't know. I didn't want to say the wrong you death. Clearly I was gonna say de- I almost said death <laughs> note, and then I, and the whole anime crew would be coming for me. I've got to watch out for like 15 different worlds. I'm, I'm glad you said death though, because when I Googled, yeah, I just wrote Kevin Bacon chill. death. Because <laughs> I'll stand whoever wants to stand up and keep track of all these genres and all these titles with me. I will take you down. Let's go. But anyway, it was death sentence. Thank you, Janelle. Yay! But uh, it appealed to I me on that right visceral. Today. I saw the devil death sentence, visceral kind of bloody, gruesome revenge story with an interesting mechanic of a person who can't die. So I kind of dug that. And I feel like, again, it's, it's bad to doubt somebody like Bill Skarsgård who keeps surprising us with pretty much everything he does, jumping from a Pennywise to playing a a truly unhinged and scary villain in the John Wick franchise without looking like he could throw down at all. So I I don't think you guys should, anybody should count out what this guy does for a performance. And uh, he's not even just jacked for this. He has another movie that came out uh, called Boy Kills World, which was kind of a indie thing that came out and is coming out this year also, which he uh plays a deaf man who gets trained in the jungle to get revenge on the murderers of his family so as one does know, wow yeah <laughs> and he's and if you've ever seen the photos from that like he is ripped ripped because it's a martial arts movie and like yeah, it's another thing so he's going taking an action turn and like it looks like the boy committed and and i trust his commitment that's all i'm gonna say i know that it's not like <laughs> traditionally super gothic but i will say it is extremely dark yeah. Uh, like to me, it seems really dark and twisted. So at Are least, we allowed like, to say I, I, gritty again, like in terms gritty, of movie? gritty, gritty. <laughs> we after the after the Dark Knight trilogy, we weren't allowed to say that, or like <laughs> Batman v Superman. We I haven't been allowed permission. to say that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it feels gritty. Thank That's you. a good one. Thank you. Um, but I mean, I feel like you're either gonna love it or hate it. But I now that I'm seeing more, I think overall, I'm just excited to see what's going to happen because I like to go into everything with a positive headspace, you know, like, okay, this could be really cool. Um, and this, this specific trailer gave me so much story, so much action. Like I know exactly what's going on and I'm super intrigued and I really need to see this. So it feels emotional too. So I'm, I'm actually, I, I have very high hopes for this. Matt and Connor, you guys are just, you guys are being real quiet over there. What's going on? Connor, go ahead. All right. Well, uh, I have not been on since the initial look dropped. And as soon as I saw it, I went, oh, Sting and Darby Allen literally had a baby. And Matt gets that reference and it actually kind of fits. So I'm happy with, uh, I, I don't hate the look goofy as it is. It's, you got to go with something different to stand out. You can't just do the Brandon Lee look again, because that's all people will compare it to. So. I, I, the, the look doesn't bother me nearly as much as it did some people online. The trailer actually really won me over because when it comes to The Crow, this is a movie that a decade ago, it seemed like a story would come out every three months where they'd say, we're making a Crow movie, we swear, and they'd lose a the director, they'd lose the writer. Luke Evans was attached to this thing forever. Um, and it, it, I, I, w- I had resigned myself to the point where like, guys, look, this property is cursed. You lost your leading man back way back when the first one came out. The fact that that movie was actually pretty good is kind of a low key miracle. It's never been good since they've had direct to DVD sequels that nobody paid attention to. Nobody really brings up the comic adaptations. It was fine to just sit there in the 90s with the cure in the background and the face paint and the hair and that be it. So for that, the fact that this trailer actually looks pretty solid. It, I'm shocked how much this won me over the the look you guys talk about how it feels gothic I, I get that too but if you guys remember that Lee Winnell movie upgrade from a few years back the look actually reminds it, it reminds me of that there's a little bit of cyberpunk thrown in there there's obviously the Gen Z influences it's dirty it's grimy it's bloody and I love the way that movie looked and I feel like even though it's it, not the same director Blumhouse isn't involved feels like some of that got carried over into this and I dig that The one thing I'll say is that one thing that people tend to forget about The Crow 
is that there's some levity to it. If, if you go back and watch the movie, Brandon Lee's swinging from the ceiling back and forth, like mocking his victims. He's quoting Edgar Allan Poe. Like the guy's having fun with it. And if you ever watch the sequels, they lost that point. They just went super serious and no, it's about revenge. It's dark. It's bloody. It's murderous. And yeah, I, I, I'm, I hope with this that they remember at least a little bit of that. And it's not just, oh, it's John Wick, but you can shoot him now. It de you're right, though. It definitely seems like he's taken it very seriously. Like, it just seems heart wrenching. The whole thing seems very, very sad. Yeah. 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 It's uh, Rupert Sanders, uh, the director of Snow White and the Huntsman, who has a real thing for birds. If we just want to get into that and crows, <laughs> because half that movie <laughs> is crows. So sorry, I didn't mean to choke you out, Matt. But uh, yeah, he's he is to crows what Matt is to helmets. You know, I mean, like, it, it's pretty wild. But. <laughs> Matt, uh, you, you don't necessarily go for these types of movies, so close us out. How do you feel? I don't, but man, I gotta say, I'm I'm with the crew here. I I really dug this. It surprised the hell out of me. I was like, by the end of him, yeah, I'll see that. <laughs> that's got that's got me. I I think all of the descriptions though were apt, right? It is very John Wick with guns and being able to stab himself and. You know, I, I dig that Wolverine Deadpool aspect, right? Uh, I do hope there's some levity there. The trailer didn't really give much indication of that at all. So um, I do what, hope they're able to... What, you just smash a guy with a shotgun? Kinda... What's not funny about that? <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> I do hope they're able to to break it up. I think we'll we'll get to the end of this, and this whole story will really just be about, you know, the crow trying to climb Everest. I think uh, Connor should get that one. Uh, that I get that joke. For... <laughs> I think that's uh, that anyway, what it really is about. You guys and your wrestling. But um, there is, I mean, it is a funny <laughs> part where, I mean, the guy does walk out into a theater and toss two heads into the crowd. So there's going to be something funny in here, I think. So, you know, it just depends on what you consider funny, you know? Um, all right, let, let's move on because we because we got a deep into that rabbit hole, but we had some strong feelings about the crow. But this was unusually positive. I threw this in here thinking there would be chaos, conflict, and a little bloodshed on our side, but none of that happened. Oh well. So, in other news that is disappointing, but we probably should have saw coming the Batman 2. We will not be getting the Batman 2 in 2025. The Batman 2 Ooh. has been knocked back to 2026. And talk about, you know, things that are starting to feel like cursed franchises. Like, we already had to delay the first movie until, when did that come out? 2021 or 20? That was 2022, right? Oh, my God. Wow. And now we're getting yeah. the second one in 2026? Jeez Louise. Am I going to care? Hopefully. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, my whole takeaway from this, we're, you know, you know, some people were trying to downplay it in, in our Slack channel, but I'm just preparing for an entire year of from Superman 2025 to when this movie comes out in 2026 to are these are the same universe articles and questions and repeated answers and re-repeated answers to all of this. Um, yeah, man. Uh, I don't know. This one just feels like I get it because of the writers and the actor strikes like everything that Warner brothers probably has going on that the other actors directors have going on. This is when we can get this, but it just feels like the momentum there is starting to starting to fade. And I love the Batman. This is not a, uh, the Batman eight. It's becoming my regular Halloween rotation. Like I, I appreciate the movie more and more as just a great de detective noir story after, after I've seen it. And, and maybe the penguin will, will be here to kind of, bridge the gap right to kind of get us and in back into that universe it's coming out late this year maybe in a little bit into 2025 it'll get us thirsty and then we'll be like oh it's just a year and then we're gonna get the batman mm -hmm. um part two so hopefully that's the effect that happens because as we will talk as a theme today sometimes some of these breaks and delays can be really detrimental to a franchise so we're going to get into all of that. But uh, yes, it is now coming out uh, early October in 2026. So, yeah. On a lighter note, though, we did have a fun, you know, we're not going to get into the Oscars because it's a week ago. But, you know, congrats to Chris Nolan. He finally got <laughs> wow. Chris Nolan leveled up and got that Oscar. Uh, I know a bunch of Oppenheimer people were, were happy about that. I love that movie. We did a whole episode on it. Go back and listen to Connor Casey and I break down Oppenheimer right after we saw it. 
it's a great episode of this show. Um, but uh, we did have a fun little Batman reunion. That was a, I mean, <laughs> well, Oscars can be so painful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I would have let it play because I love yeah. that clip. But uh, yeah, Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger getting up and uh, doing a little bit with Michael Keaton at the Oscars. Kind of redeemed Thank most you. of the Oscars for me. Like, yeah, when those bits can be so bad. But this one was so good. And Michael Keaton never misses a beat. Just being in the crowd, just being like, yeah. Just, just on, effortlessly yeah. switching back into Batman for a second. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and yeah. you just go back and you remember when people were like, this guy, the comedy guy, he can't ever, Beetlejuice guy, he can't ever be Batman. And it's just like, oh, yes, he can. Um, yeah. So that was great. Just a little side note. We love funny things. We're positive sometime around here. But uh, yeah. While we wait, there he is, the man himself. <laughs> the man. What's funnier is that Schwarzenegger didn't fight him. <laughs> They're just like, no, nope, roll with it. He's Batman. <laughs> yeah. God, gotta love that. You should be watching the live show so you can enjoy little moments like this with us. But uh, Matt, let's talk about in the ever-shifting lanes of getting the bag, losing the bag, getting the bag again. Let's talk some horror. What's happening over here? Yeah, so uh, one movie that what seemed to be in just dire straits is seemingly back on track. So Scream 7 uh, lost its director, <laughs> two of its stars. Uh, one star, it fired, and then the other star, it lost to scheduling conflicts. There's been some murkiness uh, to that. But, uh, but now it seems back on track because Scream 7 is bringing back Nev Campbell. Uh, Sydney Prescott, the star of the, I feel like it's okay. There have been a lot of stars of the franchise, but like, you know, the, the one who is just completely synonymous with it, uh, is Sydney and she is coming back for the seventh movie, but also, uh, Kevin Williamson will be directing, uh, this movie. So they, they filled both spots, uh, with big names that the franchise fans, uh, will hopefully get on board with, uh, Campbell posted a big, kind of a longer thing, a picture of the script uh, and went into detail about, you know, being excited to come back and also teaming with Williamson specifically uh, because now he's, you know, going to be in the director's chair for this one. So uh, good news. If you're, you know, it was, it was, a, we talked a lot about the drama surrounding kind of the, what seemed to be this like resurgent franchise and oh my God, they're going to jump on the momentum. And then it's just like crumbled in a matter of, it felt like a month. Uh, so now it seems, I mean, I think this is, this is as positive un until, unless you said, oh, everybody's back. <laughs> that was not going to be there for the last one, you know? This is about the best next step I feel like they could take. But I mean, you, I, I always, I adore this franchise. I'm excited to see her back in the mix, but I don't know how you guys feel. Um, um, like, <laughs> I mean, what was the last one she did? Was that Scream 5? Yeah. Is it five? Yeah, I think it was five. Yeah, was she was in five. The like, yeah, yeah, it was before the New York one. Um, and that was that was okay. That wasn't that wasn't bad. Like that's kind of part of what got us back on the track. But Nev Campbell's always been reluctant. She wasn't in that too much because that's the one that set up Melissa Barrera and Jenna Ortega and, and kind of did that. And she was a legacy character. And they did the whole requel. They did the riff on the requels and the legacy sequels and all that. And that was good. And that was good. Um. As always with Scream, it's always a challenge because it's not just bringing back a star It's and doing another slasher. It's, you have to find some way to do that kind of meta commentary over top of it. So it'll be interesting to see what happens or if they just kind of use this whole real life situation to play into the movie as well, which could be a really smart script if done right about why we're back with Sydney and, and all of that. So we know the dump truck full of money got backed up. People were pinging me saying, you hear that sound? Eep, eep, eep. That's the dump truck getting up to Nev Campbell's house with that money dump. Um, but I also included in the rundown that, uh, you know, I, while I was out seeing other movies in the past weeks, I also caught the trailer because I don't really watch trailers that much anymore online. But I caught the trailer for Abigail, which is the new film that Radio Silence and Melissa Barrera made with the team behind Scream 6. It, they, they have a new movie coming out, and it looks pretty wonderful. <laughs> like, it looks pretty great. Um, and if you haven't heard about this movie, it's about a group of people who are hired 
by Gus Fring to go into a house one night and just safeguard this little girl who they think is like a wealthy heiress or something. And they get locked in there and they're just like, whoa, what's happening there? And it turns out that little wealthy ballerina girl is actually an ancient vampire. And so they are the buffet for the night. Um, mm. And so, yeah, it, it, and it looks like a great film. So I don't know, man. Like, I hope they got something good cooked up for Scream 7 because it looks like the team behind Scream 6 is going to be all right. And it's right. going to be really all right. Because, uh, yeah, in terms of this looks like it could be like, you know, them doing for sla you know, for vampire films where they just did for for slashers, which is really make us excited about these things in an in exciting way again. So, yeah, it's also the la one of the last performances of Angus Cloud from Euphoria. So, you know, that whole Euphoria crowd is going to be there for that. And, uh, yeah, this one looks pretty, pretty good. So, I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah, and Ortega's doing well, too, right? She's doing Wednesday season oh, two. Yeah. So, I mean, like, yeah. the whole yeah, group is just uh, <laughs> doing Jenna pretty good Ortega's basically, like, taking over the world. She's fine. So, yeah. like, yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah. So yeah, and, and Abigail's Catherine Newton, Kevin Durant, Angus Cloud, Gina Carl, Gina, Wait, Gina Carlo, Carlo Esposito. Wait, actual Kevin Durant or D Kevin Durand? Okay, we okay. Yeah, no, not Kevin Durant. No, Dan <laughs> Stevens. Say, Phoenix Sun star player? No, <laughs> no. Oh, oh, Matthew Good, Dan Steve. Yeah, this this movie is gonna be something crazy. Like, yeah, we gotta. Oh, we'll be on the well, Abigail. We know it's not gonna win a championship. Mm. oh they weren't gonna win anyway stop it <laughs> stop it but uh yeah i don't know man I, I well hopefully they come up with something good for scream seven yeah. because i was really on board with the team that was on it and scream six surprised the hell out of me last year and so in this new movie abigail looks pretty good so i don't know man i don't know who's gonna win out in this one all right, let's take a quick break. But when we get back, it's time to we have a thick back half where we got to get into Peak Geek TV. There's a lot of good TV to talk about. We also got to talk about Matt's agenda. He has something, something, games, something, something. As I put it, my favorite part of the rundown. Yeah, and we got <laughs> and we got to get all into X Men's big relaunch, which is coming our way. New books, new creative teams, new angles, and my theory on how every generation is getting their own X Men. Stay tuned for Comic Book Nation. Welcome back to Comic Book Nation, the only show that does it all for geek culture and the official podcast of comicbook.com. If you missed our first half, we just talked about some big news that had been dropping over the week, including the Crow trailer. Nev Campbell coming back for Scream 7 and the showdown with those Scream 6 team. Plus, I talked about the Batman 2 being delayed and all that goes with that. So let's get into some main topic so this week we are talking about Peak Geek TV, which is when we feel whenever kind of, uh, you know, fan shows that appeal to geek fandoms really seem to be hitting. And we like to take a moment to kind of appreciate that because we've done this podcast when there has been a desert of content out there. Go back and listen to seasons two and three for those pandemic era episodes to hear us just searching through. You know, we were like Maldives all, all out there in the desert putting our ears to the ground, trying to find a little bit of water. But uh, now we're kind of rich with stuff. And this week we're going to highlight Invincible Season 2, Part 2, Halo Season 2 coming towards its exciting end. 
as well as Shogun, which we must absolutely just spend time discussing because. So I'm going to start off with Invincible Season 2, Part 2. Uh, we have an entire recap episode of Episode 5. Myself and J.K. Schmidt sit down and pull apart this episode. Everything that happens, it's pretty dense. I've been writing these recaps, and somehow Invincible has a denser recap than even Halo, even though it's 15 minutes shorter. But they pack a lot in. And we also talk about just the whole kind of effect of having this delay and coming back and what it may have done. So for the full spoilers of that discussion, go listen to that on our feed. But uh, keeping it spoiler free over here, what did you guys think? Um, Connor, I know you're a big Invincible fan. You read the comics and you are sometimes hit or miss about what this show is doing. So how did you I mean, you like it in general, but I know you don't always agree with everything. But how did you feel about the delay and coming and making this episode as a comeback? The delay was frustrating. And if you watched, you know, when we talked about the first half, it didn't really feel like there was enough to be like, yeah, you, you'll be satiated with this first half of episodes. Like, no, nah, there's there's a lot more we need to get into. And uh, you're making us wait unnecessarily. But you know what? I, getting into the whole thing about animation production and crunch and, you know, what studios demand. I'm throwing my hands up and saying there's a lot I don't know. And I'm just happy that when I get more of this and that was my reaction to this was God, I missed this show. And more than anything like this, this episode didn't have a big shocker like, Oh, Oh, somebody died or somebody's back or something horrific happened. It was like, no, it's just more of what we've already established. And there's several conflicts all going on at once. And I think what it, what really dawned on me was that I have missed geek culture comic book culture having a tim verse i i miss it having a show that everybody talks about where it's just a big team of superheroes and they're all doing different stuff and there's different storylines going on we don't really have that right now the cw what's left of their superhero menagerie is basically gone there's since there are no saturday morning cartoons anymore there's no there's no animated batman show right now we're still waiting on that next one there's no superman show there's not really even anything on the, over on the Marvel side other than, you know, what we talk about here each week on Disney+. Plus. So I'm just glad that there's a show like this where week after week it's a big old team of superheroes and a crazy barrage of villains coming at them each week. And you're just tuning in next week to see what happens. I've missed that. I'm glad it's back. Oh, you muted, buddy. Oh, yeah. nope. okay. And we'll keep going. Uh, I'll I'll give my little rundown. Do it. I will say, um, this was so gory. <laughs> like this episode was so <laughs> gory. It was like disturbing to me. And this is like the first time that I like watching the show that I was like, oh my God, they might lose. Like lose lose like everyone might lose and i it's very rare that you feel that way with any superhero content lately because you always know they're gonna succeed but man like the stakes felt really high for me in this episode and i i was kind of loving it i was kind of hating it because it was it's like disturbing but i really felt like the stakes i was like oh my gosh this is this is really crazy and I love I love that they have so many different storylines. You're right about that. Like I every time they jump from something else, I would feel even more intriguing and I would be even more interested and on the hook. And um it's I can't believe that they can pack in this much story into these episodes. Like it is it is really incredible how much storytelling they're getting in in such a short amount of time. And can we just like can people just take lessons from this that it works and we can handle it? Can we get this in live action, please? Like that we can, we can take this in, we can follow. I don't even know these characters. I've never read the comics. I forget last season. I forget the first part of this season. Am and I yet <laughs> I was uh, just loving every minute of this episode. Am I back? Can you hear me? Yes, you are yeah, back. back yes, All right. Um, yeah, I was going to say, uh, a couple points. I was going to say, I know Kyle has read the comics, but I might disagree that people who haven't might uh, disagree that there aren't some shocks in this episode mm -hmm. because there are definitely a few shocks in this episode. Um, I would also say that that's one thing I've kind of also been hearing online is people being like, oh, you know, the second batch of episodes gets got here and 
I don't even remember what happened in the first. And that's not to say you, Janelle, because I know you're very busy and we make you watch everything. So this <laughs> is taking you out of the conversation. But for casual people who are just like saying they can't get back into this because they can't. It's what are we saying? Like all of this is sitting on a streaming service. You can go back and press play and do this again. Like it's not yes. the end of the world to catch up. Yeah, the up recap catch... was very yeah, well done. They do a recap. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is not hard yeah. to get back into. It we keep I don't know what's happened. I know the pandemic and just the digital age has screwed everybody up, but like guys, we gotta remember what time is. Like a couple of months is a couple of <laughs> months. It's not two years. Yeah. They can feel like the same thing these days, but they're not the same thing. A couple of months is a couple of months. We all remember when Mark and Ani Man were throwing down on Thraxa. That's not something you just forgot about. Like, that just happened a little bit ago. It's in a frustrating break. I don't think Amazon should ever do this again. Like, either you have a season ready or you don't. Like, get it together and just have it ready and then deploy it however you're going to deploy it. This is a show that you should have had gone with the strategy that you had, which is dump first seasons as a binge. Once they get popular enough, come back with a second season weekly and get your returns like that should have been this. Don't try to do this Netflix crap. You're not Netflix. Like you don't try to split up these seasons. We're not selling DVDs anymore. So everybody chill. Um, but that said, like, yeah, you could get back into this. And yeah, this episode is dense. Like there is a lot that has to happen, like from where Mark starts to him just coming back to Earth. But as I wrote the review for all, because I've seen all four episodes and I just kind of reviewed the entire season as somebody who did not read the comics, I said that this does the, the hard work of a sophomore season of growing up your character, expanding his or her or her or their world and making like making that development happen across all these characters is a big undertaking. But you see, you know, how thick and rich this world is just from an episode like this where Mark coming back to Earth has like a checklist of things that are going to happen when he comes back to Earth. And we don't even get into all of it. Like we don't even get the words like Viltrumites, Angstrom Levy, words like that that were major are not even mentioned. This is stuff that's still hanging over all the stuff we've got to do. So. I thought this was a good episode and the where it ended, I, I just was kind of like, if you had just kept this season going, my only thing I've said is if you've kept this season going and this was the follow up a week later to episode four, like this show's hype would have been like out of off planet high, like yeah. going into Christmas, like it had been insane. Um, so yeah. I think they kind of blew the bag on that front, but uh, I thought this was a good comeback episode and I, again, did not read the comics, so I have no idea, like, some of these things are coming <laughs> until they start happening, and I'm like, wait, what? And, uh, yeah, this had some pretty gruesome and, and brutal things, and it reminds you very quickly what the world of Inventable is all about. But then we also get a stinger that's a little more hopeful that reminds us that this is still a comic book world, and we can still have a few surprises coming our way, so... That was pretty well, good. Does anybody else have the problem, though, when Peter Cullen is on screen, whenever he just starts talking, I'm like, I'm just hearing Optimus Prime monologue, guys. I, I just want to hear him shout, one shall stand, one shall fall. Well, I don't, I mean, Roll I don't out. think that's ever a problem. I mean, that's like telling an actor to just do one thing is, is always weird. But like, I just, I think, I think what they do and what this show and, and the makers do is everything is kind of has a level of satire to it. And so I feel like they make Peter Cullen deliver lines that sound very optimist -y, And yeah. they know that he sounds very optimist -y. And like he's going to deliver a lot of those monologues that are going to be like the rousing ones, right? Like we can unite to defend the universe, and like you're going to be like, oh man, and it's going to be like all rousing. Cold. So, uh, I, I mean, it's been all—it's only been all my life that I've been like hearing this man's bad, voice, you good. know, inspire me. So, but yeah, but uh, I think I'm they more distracted with Seth. Seth. Yeah, yes, oh, yeah. I'm him. way more distracted with Seth. But I love the way they use him because it's total Seth Rogen. Like you don't hire him. I just to be he should be smoking but... a bowl. Like I don't. <laughs> his character <laughs> just should be. I, Toby, I can't. do a Seth. Yeah. Do a Seth. Oh, I can't. No, that's that's Brandon Davis. I don't try to. I don't try to step on on <laughs> Preston. No, I can't. I can't do it. Brandon Davis does the uh, the better uh, the better Seth Rogen, and, and that's his. I'm not. I don't need to compete on that and lose. I'm good. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, anybody else, uh, Matt? Did you want to jump in? I think we we skipped you here. 
No, but I mean, it's fun. I mean, you covered a lot of it. I mean, I, I thought this was a good episode. For me, I come at it the because I agree with you. Your ultimate point of does it lose? Did it lose some momentum amongst the like conversation of all the things we've got going on and shows and things? Yes. And I feel like that that is probably a missed opportunity for me personally. I don't mind breaks. I'm starting to get to the point where like a delay or whatever is like, number one, it's pretty like old hat at this point. I'm pretty used to it. But two, it actually just gives me time to watch other stuff. So I I'm like, look, we're blessed to be doing what we do. Right. So there's like no actual shortage of content outside of TV. So if this thing does, you know, stops for a couple months, I just use that to like go and play games or go do whatever, read a book or do it. Like there's so much other stuff to to take in that I just don't, I don't care. Like I was like, oh great, Invincible's back. That's how I look at it. I didn't even miss it because it was just so much other stuff going on. I was like, oh, that's great. But I know I'm not like, you know, I know that's not the same for everyone. And so some people are just like, it's all about Invincible. And for those people, I could totally see how a couple months drop off uh, would be would suck. And then also, too, it does take it out of the conversation. And when s there's so much content hitting, that will hurt it uh, when it comes to, you know, year end discussions uh, or award discussions of like, what was the great thing? Sometimes that time away, especially in the middle of a season, can kind of knock it out of. Uh, your mind's orbit a little bit. So I get it. But this was a good episode. I really dug it. Uh, I, I'm i enjoying this a lot. I do agree with Janelle. There are some times where like animation or not, I, I wince at some of the things they pull off in the show. Of like, oh my God, why would you bend a leg like that? Why would it break? Like there's <laughs> there are some things that just truly shock me along the lines of The Boys. The Boys does the same thing. I, I watch that show and go, oh God. And I know things are coming. I know it's, I know things are oh, happening and I expect it, but wow, they still manage to trip me out a little bit every so often. So Invincible does the same thing, but great, great TV. Yep. And I got to say, it's great for somebody like me who hasn't read the comics because this show, I mean, it never goes where you think it's going to go and where you, what happens is never what, <laughs> what you think is going to happen. And I love that. So yeah, it, that's it's, on it's, Amazon Prime Video. And uh, I've seen a lot of people just kind of coming for Amazon because they didn't necessarily push this debut. It, I mean, we were even kind of confused about when it was coming back. So they didn't do a great job. If you're going to split things into two parts, you need to get a whole PR rollout yeah. for the second part. And that didn't happen. And a lot of people, the major reaction was like, wait, why am I seeing Invincible on the timeline? Oh, wait, it's back. And then people being like, yeah. oh, my God. That's not so, a good thing. <laughs> <you know. laughs> no. Uh, somebody was trying to chime in or something, I feel like, before we get No, out. no, no. No, you're good. All right. Well, you get to talk anyway, because uh, you are the sole person. Before we get into episode four, we want to go back and just kind of get your impressions of Shogun, because uh, you have not been here when we started kind of getting into this show, which has quickly exploded into becoming, you know, if not the most acclaimed show of 2024. It's really up there at the top and is in the running for, you know, best of the year already. So uh, how did you like this? And were you familiar with any of the source material before this? So I freaking love this. And what was driving me nuts about it was when I was I left the day it premiered. And then throughout <laughs> Italy, they had all these advertisements for Disney+. Plus. Now, they don't have Hulu over there. So they just kept advertising stuff that was going to be on Hulu. But then you have the Disney logo next to it. So it's like this and poor things were everywhere. And it's like, ah, on the friendly, family, family friendly Disney channel, which is just so <laughs> bizarre. And then I come back. I'm like, OK, we're binging this now. And it's incredible. I have never read the book. I've never watched the original miniseries. But if you're going to give me a show, a video game, a movie, what have you set in this era of Japan, it's like selling water in the desert. It is the easiest sell in the world to me. So I dug the I dug the hell out of this. This is Game of Thrones in Japan. It's got all of the intrigue. It's got great characters. In a way, it does feel. I was sitting back. I'm like, even if I didn't know that this was based on a book, this feels like this was a book where the main where you think the main character is going to be Sonata. It's not. It's Blackthorn, and you see him at the absolute lowest rung on his way into the country and then slowly gradually build his way up with different relationships and different, you know, 
gaining different allies and different enemies to the point now where I'm just like, I really hope this guy doesn't have just some tragic ending. But I also know this is that era of Japan where that absolutely could happen. Um, but the moment you start looking up the history of this stuff, you go, no, these were some of these guys that are the characters in this show were big role players in actual Japanese history. So my even though it's not hard to look up what actually happened, I'm still I'm, I'm holding that against myself where I'm just like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I just want to sit on the edge of my seat and watch every conversation unfold. And yet, you know, we talk about peak TV. This fits right in. Yeah. So there you go. There's Connor. He's all caught up with us. So let's get into uh, episode four, uh, which is reminding me because, first of all, I'm going to go on a bit of a soapbox and say, like, one thing that is bothering me is I thought there would be more people who had actually, like, read this book because this novel is so famous. Some of y'all got to get outside and touch more grass and read more. Everybody, read more. Get outside. This is one of the best books I think I've ever read because it is just like the experience of the show. You get to know the characters. And it's not easy because, I mean, like, those are Japanese names you're reading and things like that. You got to keep straight. But it's just so well written. And this was Game of Thrones. This was written in 1975. This was Game of Thrones long before Slow Mo Martin picked up a typewriter and started banging it out and trying to and trying Hello, to make his Mo thing. Martin. And I wouldn't be surprised if he was a big fan of this novel as well, because there's so much of it that seems coded into into what he did. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm frustrated. Tornaga is, just Ned, Tornaga is just Ned Stark. Like it's a no, one Tor one. you can't. What are you saying? Yeah, Toranaga could never be Ned Stark. Toranaga no. keep keeping his head and making moves and dips well, he, whatever yeah, he, he needs to dip. He's, he's Ned first Stark season out. Ned Stark, where it's like I clearly have a responsibility. I could seize power if you just ask me. I don't want to. I'm the only responsible oh, one around here, and I'm surrounded by bastards. You guys are. I love this. I got to write this article. I really do got to write this article up because I, I think people still. It's it's much more pronounced in the book about in even this thing about the eightfold fence. Like you have to realize like what they're telling you in these things in these moments is what this is doing is talking kind of breaking down Japanese psychology at the feudal time about how people can have these aspects that 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 self that they have to do the duty, the honor, the stuff with that hides, you know, who they are inside, their personal desires, hungers, ambitions and all of that, and, and these being kind of separate worlds within people and things like that. And you got to really kind of be careful because what I love about this story, the show, the book, the, and what they're doing in the show is nobody is a Ned Stark in this. Like, Ned Stark was kind of like noble to a fault, right? Nobody in this show is noble. If you watch carefully, everybody from the lowliest little guy in the first episode who you think is just the bum that uh, Blackthorn has to translate with, who turns out to be Toranaga's spy, to things in this episode like that uh, courtesan who keeps showing up at key moments that nobody seems to key in on, who is whispering in, in you know the nephew's ear about, oh, if he was in charge instead of his uncle, and then the nephew manipulates you know, Toranaga's son right after that. It's like, okay, well, who is the courtesan saying that for? Is it for herself? Is it for somebody else? And who's doing it and why? Like, everybody has an agenda in this. Everybody has multiple facets to themselves. Everybody has, like, a false master, a true master, like, somebody they're working for. And that's what I love about the show is there. this is Game of Thrones, but it's way more complex. There's way more, pe many more people who are secretly playing sides, influencing things, pushing things you know, trying to take advantage of things. And I love it. And I love just the, how the sides, you know, Japan's lords are infighting. There's even Christianity has this massive kind of infight happening within itself. It's great stuff. And uh, this, this episode, episode four, it just kind of builds on it because we begin to see how that complexity plays out, right? Like you think by the end of episode three, like Blackthorn and Toranaga are BFF. They're swimming together. But uh, then Toranaga kind of dips and then just leaves him hostage, basically, in this episode, which is one of my favorite things about, I think the book also does highlight more, is what the nature of hostage is in feudal Japan, where you get kind of soft, polite treatment, but you're really a political tool 
being kind of used and and softly kept in place. And that's kind of what happened. So I, I thought that was really good in, in how you see little shades of who Toronaga is in this, like when he comes to Izu and uh, I always just don't want to butcher these names. Yabashige, Yabashigi. Uh, God, I love um, the guy who's like the, the Lord who's always like, stuck between people and, and trying to yep. boil people alive. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I got to keep this pulled up. Uh, Kashigi Yabashigi. Yeah. Kashigi Yabashigi. Who's uh, played by the wonderful uh, Tadanabu Asano. Yeah. Um, so whenever Yabashigi like gets off the boat and the men are cheering for him and then you see Toranaga kind of come up, and then spin that around so that they're cheering even harder for him. And you just see Yabushiki like, what just happened? Because he just dips again, Toranaga. <laughs> King of dipping, man. I gotta you gotta you gotta take him as a <laughs> example for my social life. Like just come in, manipulate, get out, dip before anybody looks and be and then you know have everybody cheering for you. But um yeah, man, I could get into this for a whole show. Like I could literally spend a whole show just talking about this show in some way. And some days I wish I was, but what did you guys think, Matt, Janelle? Because uh, we've had some good discussions about this. Janelle, what'd you think about going into episode four? And also, MVP, Fujisama came out of this as a MVP that the internet is loving by the way she handled those guns. And yeah, yeah I went to my wife she... and I was like, we got to have a talk. <laughs> I pulled out my pistols and was like, let me see you defend this home. And she was like, what are you talking about? Anyway. <laughs> Um, I will say that I feel like the show is getting better and better each episode. So it's obviously just a really strong show from the jump. But I mean, every episode, as you kind of get to know the characters more and more, and it kind of reveals more of the storyline, I'm more and more intrigued by it. So I'm very impressed um, with this episode. I love like romance, like the romantic connection. The, obviously, the tension has been being built this entire time. So um I, I love I love seeing that uh, and it it does feel like Game of Thrones, but it like also doesn't. I don't I feel like if you're if you didn't like Game of Thrones, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't like this. Um, it's just it, it's, I guess, reminiscent of like drama, but I, I don't know. There's just a different there's something different about it, obviously, culturally. Um, you can feel that. But what really intrigues me the most is what you told me, Kofi, is that how most of the show was built on actual history, like from that era and what was actually happening, because I love that. It's like I can take things at face value, like, yes, we're following specific characters, but a lot of this was actually happening politically um, and, you know, in in this manner with these countries. And that is so cool to me because it's like a history lesson on top of being interesting which is just really special. You're muted. <laughs> I can't stress how much this book got me into, I was already a fan of anime and stuff like that, but you know, this was the time we were still calling it Japanimation. I didn't really know the culture that I was kind of dipping into. This book did light years of work for kind of catching me up on Japanese because I was always obsessed with like samurais and ninjas like but in that little American boy way like it's cool to throw throwing stars right. and stuff. Um, this book does a lot to teach you about because it's a very Moby Dickish type of book. And if you don't know what that means, like Moby Dick has a whale hunt, but a lot of it is just descriptions of what whaling was like in New England in, in that early yeah. part of like what the 18th, 19th century. And so that's what most of that's the value of the book. There's some stuff in there that you can't learn again unless you would read volumes of historical text but this book is the same way like everything about japan the feudal system the whole philosophy and and of life and death and and honor and duty and all of that and comparing it to western society this was the first book that taught me that like english people didn't believe in bathing they thought it was death you only bathe like once or twice in your life <laughs> like you were born and you're like when you died or and stuff like that and all these different cultural things from history I had no idea about, yeah, the whole, like, what the system of, like, regents, Christianity spread, Magellan's past, like, all of this stuff you learn from reading this book or even watching the show now. And it is, it, it's fascinating to see where the parallels with history are. 
Speaking of brutality, one of the most historically real things in this episode. Sorry, Janelle, we put you through the ringer of brutality this week. We made you watch some pretty gnarly stuff, but uh, I'm cool with yeah, it. That I ending. like it. I, I'm that, from the Walking Dead background. I got this. <laughs> yeah, <That's true. laughs> I, but um, yeah, that that whole thing with naval warfare and William Adams, who Blackthorn is based on, that that's all very real, and that was kind of the game changing thing about that period of history was Japan beginning to learn about Western naval warfare and stuff like that. So, and precision cannon firing and all that kind of stuff and how to measure and all that. So. Yeah, man. I mean, like we said, we could keep going on. We got other stuff to talk about, so I guess we should get to it. But uh, Shogun, I'm just I'm hyped because, like I said, this was such a big, big, big thing for me, the book. And I was worried about this show coming out, but it's exceeded all expectations. And the cast is just killing it and the production values are killing it. And uh, yeah, man, I can't wait for the next episode. Uh, finally, yeah, we got to talk. Me and Matt break down. I almost forgot about it. Halo. But uh, Halo Season 2 is coming to its end. And um, we got, you know, there was some shade thrown at us when I was talking about putting this in our peak Geek TV lineup. But I get it. Some people may not be tuning in to this or or have Paramount Plus. For but it's, it's definitely all peak of... geek. I mean, this is yeah. geek defined. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> if you want to throw shade, that's okay. But like, we're going to be over here enjoying what has been an excellent rebound of a show. Like one of the bigger come ups for a show that I think I've ever seen yeah. between Halo season one and Halo season two. And as I put in a headline that seems to be resonating with people, we are finally getting around to the events of the first Halo game for all you people who have been mad about that. We are here and we're here in a better way that Matt and I, you know, go in depth on our kind of recap episode about why it mattered. Even Matt can see why you have to sometimes take off a helmet and, and get into something more to build a show up. And so like, if he can have that growth, so you can, so can you guys. And so, yeah, this is included in our geek in our peak geek TV. Please go listen to our recap episode and our interview with Colonel Ackerson himself, Titan star, halo star, Joseph Morgan, Matt sat down with him for an excellent conversation and go check that out on the feed. But I am ready for this finale episode. All that's left for me is for halo to prove they can do a game of Thrones style, big battle episode. The one in the season one finale was trash. We can just say it. It was trash. And we're really hoping that the season two finale will, you know, stick it to the haters and be like, here you go. Here's an awesome battle episode. And where we end is where you want us to end. We're going to get into the Halo video game stuff now. So definitely wanted to be here. Uh, Janelle or Connor, I, I mean, I know what Matt would say. He would say exactly what I would say because we already talked about it. But uh, Janelle or Matt or Janelle or Connor, how are you feeling? Janelle, ladies first. You want me to go first? Okay. Go uh, yeah, this has been so exciting. I'm actually really curious. Uh, I mean, I have my blow up moment, the moment that I was just like, finally so excited about because I've been complaining about it the whole time when we actually had a human pick up a sword and use it to kill someone. Uh, that was, I've been waiting. I'm like, why aren't we picking up the other weapons? Like when they drop them. But um, how many more episodes do we have? Is there one more? Yep. One. Next episode is the season One finale. One more. Wow. Yeah. I I will say that I feel really confident about the lead up here. Like I don't feel confused or that I've missed out on a lot of information. And you know, with a lot of the Disney Plus shows, we've been thinking, how are they going to wrap this up with one episode? I don't feel that way with this. And that's a good feeling. Um, I feel like we got a lot of information in this last episode of kind of like the whereabouts of everyone, what everyone's doing, the history, what the ring or the halo or the arch, whatever they all call it, different things is. Um, so I love, I loved the information of this episode. This is another one where I just feel like each episode is getting better. Um, and and I'm just really enjoying it. There is a lot going on, but again, I can follow, which is great. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I mean, I kind of do, but I don't. It's like I want to predict it, but I feel like I'd rather just sit back and enjoy and watch what unfolds. Um, also, Klaus, I keep calling him Klaus from Vampire Diaries. <laughs> <laughs> oh he's so good morgan like i'm just i i love his character and he has a little bit of redemption i love to see that 
Um, Halsey, I'm just, her storyline is so interesting to me. Like that's the most interesting part of the whole show because I just want to know like about the scientific links and what everything means. Oh, we know um, where we're going with that. We're getting into the deeper, crazier Halo lore. Yeah. Four bit forerunners and the flood and all that. Yeah, it's coming. I'm excited. I'm very excited about that storyline. So yeah, I'm just very satisfied with the show. I wish everyone could see it, even if you just like do a trial and you binge it. Like it's it's great. It's it's a great show. Yeah. Connor, uh, take us out on this subject. Uh, just real quick, how'd you feel? Man, I, I hate to throw the grenade on this, but I just I, I I get that it is better than season one. And yes, episode four with the fall of reach delivered. Everything since then has kind of been, okay, we are stumbling our way towards the actual stuff from the first game. Arbiter is here, but it, there's nothing that from what his character was in the games. Um, I do not, as much as I love Bukim Woodbine as an actor, I do not care about him and his wife looking for their kid. Um, when it's John and it's Kai, they're fine. Maki feels like, hey, we hired her for the first season. She's back and we don't really know how to get rid of her. So let's just keep her around. Um, it there are ways that this thing can keep improving, but it's still just kind of stumbling its way forward and ha ha with some of the halo iconography attached to it. You know, uh, I'm glad you guys are enjoying it, but for me, it's like, sh w tell me when the action scenes are popping up. Cause otherwise I'm just trying to fast forward through some of these scenes. All right. Good to have you back, buddy. Okay, that's our thing for Halo, and uh, I didn't throw it in here because I tend to enjoy it for my own personal enjoyment, but Star Wars The Bad Batch is in its final season mm. and is better than ever. It is definitely darker, it's more mature, it's getting into the serious nitty-gritty about what happens to these clones, how do they kind of band together or to survive or find their way into the Empire, and they're even tying it together with the mess of Rise of Skywalker to help explain the Emperor and the cloning and all that. So check that out on Disney Plus if you're not watching the other stuff we mentioned because, yeah, um, Star Wars The Bad Batch final season. And I, and I say, we don't. people have said, why don't you guys talk about this? Guys, I, I literally do everything in geek culture, but there's some things like I try to just enjoy and, and be able to watch. And that's one of them. I love Star Wars animation. I don't like hearing everybody's reaction to Star Wars animation all the time. So I just try to enjoy <laughs> it. But uh, Bad Batch is out here and we are watching it. All right. Now for Matt's agenda. Matt, take it away. Yeah, I just wanted to um, really quickly highlight. And it, it actually is a perfect segue to what we've got coming up. But uh, Marvel Champions uh, is one of my favorite games. It's actually, you can see it in the background here. And uh, we're adding Jubilee, one of my favorite X-Men characters to the roster. Uh, she's the, the deck that uh, is coming out later this year. Uh, really kind of highlights the like lightheartedness and fun of the character. Uh, but like most uh, champions in the game, if you, if you put it in the right hands like she can be as deadly as anyone else uh and what i love about this is that her ability set kind of highlights the like the kind of the spark show right that she's always known for like her her light abilities it actually highlights you being able to use multiple resources to make those abilities even more powerful so like if something hits for damage but depending on the resources you used if you used a bunch more sometimes you can add confuse to that or you can stun somebody or you can just make them hit harder uh for those of us who were you know big fans during like the uh generation x uh era or just even like the classic jubilee team ups you know wolverine is an ally in this uh she even has they have a team up attack that they can do depending on the card that comes up uh chambers in this husk nice to see some husk appreciation <laughs> so like there's some great uh characters in the mix to this and this is all leading into the age of apocalypse expansion the next big x expansion that is coming out in march at the end of march uh so at this point in time this game went from having zero X-Men characters in it to having pretty much like all of the, a lot of the major core characters. I mean, between Cyclops, Rogue, Storm, uh, Gambit, Wolverine, like all those people, Colossus, all those people are represented. Now we're adding Jubilee to the mix. It's it's a cool time to be an X-Men fan and it's a cool time to be an X-Men fan in Marvel Champions. So wanted to highlight that. We'll have more on that uh, on the site. Uh, and that teases up 
for oh one quick thing actually before i want to mention uh if you have been following our star wars unlimited uh content both on the comic book nation youtube page and here uh the game is out now i've been very excited about it. i've been playing more uh and you can find an article that kind of if you want to jump in for the first time you don't know jack about it you can go to uh comicbook.com and find our everything you need to know article which tells you the things you want to jump into first which decks, which boxes you want to grab, what all the cards mean, all of that stuff. So one-stop resource there if you are a, a newbie either to Star Wars or to TCGs in general. So I hope that helps. Um, leading into this, we have an X-Men relaunch to talk about, Kofi. Yes, we do. Uh, I don't know. I know you're Matt Sick is just behind the scenes, so I'm going to let him catch his breath because he's been down bad <laughs> for yeah, the last right. couple of days. I know he's me measuring out the breaths each a little bit of a time, so... Yeah, we're gonna we got a whole relaunch plan. So if you are if you don't know, like we've been doing this for six years here at Comic Book Nation. Go back to the start of the feed if you want to hear us being young and hilarious. But uh, one of the things we started off with <laughs> as our main features of this podcast was tracking the X Men reboot with uh, Jonathan Hickman's Krakoa era of X Men, which began with uh, House of X and Powers of Ten. Well, now that run that began in 2019 is officially coming to an end with this, you know, the whole fall of X event. But then we are going to get a new start, X-Men from the ashes. And it is now been revealed who the creative teams for these books will be and what they will kind of Ooh. be about. So here's what we're going to be working with. Uh, starting at the top. We are going to be getting uh, X Men. Which one do they do? I forget which order they do it in this chip. Uh, okay, so yes, yeah, X Men, then Uncanny, then Exceptional. Got it. So we're going to be doing X Men, just a title called X Men, which will be written by Jed McKay with art by Ryan Stegman, some of the people that we've had yeah. in the Krakoa era. And this team will be Cyclops, Beast, Magneto, Psylocke, Kid Omega, and Temper with magic and juggernaut so kind of eclectic blend of characters right um it, it's it's a pretty pretty eclectic blend right there and that's pretty interesting people are already freaking out about cyclops's new outfit and yeah <laughs> it, it, it's an outfit he looks a little young but i don't know if cyclops is young or what's going on there there's a little bit of a mystery but uh it looks like we're gonna get Psylocke with a pretty gnarly sword and some of this feels like it was teed up in dead x-men because they did get to a reality where there was a kind of an x-men team that kind of resembled this and they were kind of dealing with that so i'm really kind of interested to see what's going on here jed mckay has been doing some interesting things so it's going to be really interesting to see like what happens here yeah if you've been following uh, his avengers run I think he like he is custom made for this book. Like he can he knows how to maximize a team and he's been doing essentially a a pre alpha X-Men over there anyway. He's been like showing like what their abilities can do individually and together and why they're important. Just move that over to X-Men, you got a match made in heaven. I cannot I am so hyped for that, but that's not even the best. I, I mean, that's like one of three amazing creative teams. <laughs> so go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. and I, I just like, but it's just like the interesting personalities you're going to have. Like, it's interesting. It looks like we're going to get a classic beast and, a, and Cyclops. Psylocke's going to be a little bit edgier. Magic's been kind of stepping out. Then you get these people like Juggernaut, Magneto, and Kid Omega, which alone sounds like it'll be interesting to see. So, oh, man. All right, but well, let's move on to... One of mine that I think I'm the most excited about, which was Uncanny X-Men by Gail yeah. Simone and David Marquez. And uh, that'll be coming out in August. And that team will be Rogue, Gambit, Nightcrawler, Jubilee, and Wolverine kind of uh, doing their thing and going on an adventure. And finally, we're going to get Eve Ewing and Carmen Carnero doing Exceptional X-Men, which will see uh, Kitty Pride and White Queen Emma Frost training a next generation of X-Men who will be new characters or characters I'm not at least familiar with, Bronze, Axo, and, and me Melee. Um, so now let's go back up. So I want to order this because in my head I ordered it as uh, Uncanny X-Men, then X-Men, then Exceptional X-Men because I made the joke in our Slack that what Marvel for to me is essentially doing is giving a X-Men team to every kind of generation of readers. So... Uncanny X-Men, Gail Simone's team, 
or no, or no um, yeah, Uncanny X-Men, Gail Simone's team is clearly to me for the Gen X X-Men fans. Those people who read 80s X-Men and got into 90s X-Men. And this is your team because this is it like right here, right? Like this was who they created for kind of the Jet X or X-Men. Then you get, uh, you know, this X-Men book from McKay, which seems very much like millennial X-Men. This seems like the new X-Men, the kind of weird offbeat classic mix of X stuff that we're going to get. And then clearly this exceptional X-Men is some clearly some damn Gen Z X-Men if I've ever seen it in my life. Right from the cover art, you can tell what they're going for there. So you get an X-Men, you get an X-Men, you get an X-Men. This is going to be wild, and I'm very interested yeah. to see what happens when you put your chips across the roulette board. I mean, it's going to work to some extent because yeah, I saw took one look at Gail Simone's thing, and I was like, okay, I'm in. Like, yeah, you, yep, you know exactly. what X-Men I came up under. I came up under Rogue and the Leather Jacket and Jubilee being the new kid on the block and all that, and her and Wolverine. And, yeah, so I'm already in. So nice work. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. Like, looking at the creative teams – I actually would have expected uh, X-Men, just the one that, that's just X-Men, to be Simone's book, typically because of the roster. Like, that roster, just Kid Omega alone, like, that dude is built for Simone. Like, there are certain characters that scream Gail Simone's kind of, uh, you know, ability to write banter and break down a character and find you know lighthearted areas to explore but also kind of deep rich ones right uh that roster i if you had just given me the creative teams and the roster separately i would have picked that one to be simone so i am surprised that she's writing the straight up what feels like classic group obviously i cannot wait to see jubilee in like in her you know talented uh pencil there right and pen like i'm very excited uh, to see what she has there but i'm also super stoked for ewing's book like carnero if you've been looking at the captain marvel book during uh kelly thompson's run carnero was doing some beautiful artwork uh in that book so i'm very excited to see what she can do with this new x make team you also have kitty pride and emma frost two of my favorite x-men characters yeah marauders so and, i'm like, yeah. <laughs> like that's marauders that's essentially hey let's take the leaders of marauders and put some newbies with them and that can be magic uh if it's done well so like across the board i'm i'm hyped you know i will say the mckay one is probably the one that speaks to me directly only because i'm a huge cyclops fan always have been uh and and i also psylocke as well like those characters are just kind of were my era in a lot of ways uh and i'm excited to see what if you've been you reading his see. moon knight my god his moon knight is so good and he can do like hit i'm a, i'm so excited to see what he can do with juggernaut and i don't care about that character at all never <laughs> never have but i'm excited to see what he can do so yeah i'm i'm, I'm hyped for this uh we'll see if they can retain some of the krakoa elements that i've loved but i'm excited for this so far are you a cyclops psylocke shipper is that what you're trying to tell us? And so, oh no, words? no, uh, I am a uh, Cyclops Emma Frost shipper for life. Sorry, I've always been in favor Ooh. of that relationship. Gene can go, you know, catch a ship somewhere else. <laughs> I've always been, wow. there. I've always been there. Wow, always been there. That is my preeminent couple of X Men, other than Rogue and Gambit, wow. obviously. But like them, that's been my thing. So that's always been a hot take for me. But I love them. So then, Gene wow. with Wolverine, or how did how does that work? No, I don't care what Jean does. She can do whatever. Okay. Fair. <laughs> she, Fair. she is free to pursue whoever she would like to pursue. Well, I mean, don't in the Krakoa era, she was getting, she was on that Zendaya Challengers tip with uh, getting Cyclops <laughs> and Wolverine. She was like, I'm not making choices. Wow, what it's a, did not whatever. expect that reference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I mean, you remember that McKay thing? We did a whole story on that. I they, do. We yes. printed out the chart where they had the little secret passages between their rooms. So, yeah, Jean Grey was like, "Yeah, I'm done making choices here." Sometimes, uh, so oh, I can't even sing that song. Jesus. Don't, All right, move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. So, uh, Janelle, how do you feel? Because we're going to be throwing you. I mean, you're going in the deep end of this X Men relaunch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, hopefully it'll be like a good onboarding point because you're kind of the person we got to watch here because yeah you don't want to get too deep into none of this X Men craziness. You've made that very clear, and <laughs> you, you have a threshold when it's when it's good accessible X Men. You're in when it gets yeah. too 
in too much into the cable bishop of it all you're like leave me out of this so i mean i i will say i do like bishop because i have a mod in my channel that is named after bishop so i actually know a little bit of so i will correct <laughs> you on that <laughs> so he's like okay. bishop's the best x-men you have to get to know bishop i'm like all right all right i'll get to know bishop and then uh, like i love uh magic i love magic yeah. um because she just looks cool um, so I feel like there are obviously like buzzwords and there's, there are certain, um, certain X-Men and certain mutants that, that get, you know, tickle my fancy, get me excited about it in each, I guess, iteration of this. So I, I don't really know how I'm going to, um, I hope that I don't get a little overwhelmed, but I, I'm going in with a positive headspace because I, I have been missing, you know, we don't read our comics as much in here. So um, like for the main show. So I feel like learning, um, learning more about these characters and like developing my knowledge of X-Men is, is paying off and I'm ready. Like I am ready. I'm, let's do this. <laughs> and, if <laughs> none of this works, and if none of this works, X-Men 97 drops next week. Oh my gosh, I'm actually so excited for that too. So, oh yeah, no, we're gonna be on the X Men '97 tip next week. Don't worry about that. Perfect. We're gonna be covering that. You can also uh, check out the Fade Zero feed. They have some stuff from like premiere events and reactions early. So, go over there and check that out after you check out some of our stuff too. And uh, yeah, X Men '97 will be in conversation. We, I actually cut some conversation about that this week because of what happened, and I was just like, and. Yeah, until we know more, I'm cutting that out. We're not, we're not, we're not talking about that yet, because uh, that keeps getting weirder by the moment. So we will be talking about the show X Men '97 come next week when it premieres. So, all right, that's a great place to kind of uh, take us out. As any, we are Comic Book Nation, the only show that does it all for geek culture. As I said at the start, we've dropped a lot of content this week. Um, thank you to everybody who came to last week's show. Uh, which quickly has become the biggest episode of any comic book podcast this year and maybe of last year. I mean, too, uh, for our kind of immediate reaction and eulogy to Akira Toriyama, creator of Dragon Ball. I got a lot of positive feedback. We never do something like that for traffic. I, I just really want to be clear about that. Like, those are not traffic plays. That was us kind of reacting in real time. To something um, very sad, but I got a lot of great messages from people saying, hey, you know, I didn't even necessarily listen to the show that caught that or had somebody pass it to them and say, you know, thank you. And what you guys said in the discussion really helped me and helped me through that tough moment. And that's the kind of stuff I really like about this show. It's when I get messages like that. I don't share my feelings with you guys because I like to just keep it, you know, real detached. I got my eightfold fence up. There you go. There's a Shogun reference. But uh, that kind of stuff really does touch touch me and, and makes me feel good about what we're doing and why we do this. So uh, thank you, everybody, for jumping in and helping that episode become something very special in a dark moment. Um, and thank you, everybody, who's been listening to all of our segments. We have Anime Initiative for you anime fans. We have Quick Save for all the gaming fans where we're doing our Halo recaps and talking gaming news. Matt's doing the poll list. We have those other shows on the other feeds for Marvel and Pokemon, and we have all kinds of stuff in between. Our boy Liam Crowley did the uh, Riptide Radio for the Percy Jackson show, so if you're just getting into that, we have a whole show for that as well. Go check it all out on the uh, Comic Book Nation feeds. All right, that'll do it for me. This is Kofi Outlaw. You can find me out there on socials along with my co-hosts. You can find me first. at Matt Aguilar CB. <laughs> <laughs> You can Go find ahead, me on Connor. YouTube at Connor J. Casey. Yeah, you can find me at Janelle Wheeler and everything except for Twitch, where it's just my first name, Janelle. Oh, you locked that down? You just you just doing the share? I did. The I share did. and the Beyonce? You did the yes. Beyonce? All right. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, everybody, take it easy. Have a good week. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in, as always. And we will see you sooner before later with another one of our Common Book Nation segments. Peace. Later. Peace.